Hi, everybody. Welcome to week six. My name is Dr. Christina Baker, and today we're going to be looking at the next chapters 11 and 12. Let me share my screen with you. Okay, so we are going to be working on the conclusion talking about that today. Last time we met, we were talking about like the body, and we're also talking about creating outlines. I want to remind you that a great speech is like a three course meal. Your introduction is like your appetizers and the body and the entree is like the meat. And that's the body. That's where your main points are. That's a main meal. Then the conclusion is a lot like the dessert. You want to leave something sweet with the audience. Almost at the finish line. When reading a great novel, many people Some people will actually jump ahead hundreds of pages and read the last chapter just to see what happens. Humans have innate start and to do the same thing, get to the end. And imagine reading a novel and finding out the author just stopped writing five or six chapters from the end. How satisfied would you be with the author? In the same way, when a speaker doesn't think through his or her conclusion properly, audience members are often left just dissatisfied. In other words, conclusions are really important. As a public speaking professors and, and authors, we have seen many students give otherwise good speeches that seem to fall apart at the end. I've seen students end with three main points by saying things like, okay, I'm done, or thank God it's over, or thanks, now what? Do I just sit down? It's understandable to feel relief at the end of a speech. Remember that as a speaker, your conclusions is the last chance that you have to drive home your ideas. When a speaker opts to the end of the speech with an ineffective conclusion or no conclusion at all, the speech loses the energy it's been created and the audience is left confused and disappointed instead of falling prey to emotional exhaustion. Remind yourself to keep your energy up as you approach the end of your speech and plan ahead so that your conclusion will be an effective one. Of course, a good conclusion will not rescue a poorly prepared speech. Thinking again of the chapters in the novel, if one bypass all the content, in the middle, the ending often isn't meaningful or helpful. So take advantage of the advice in the chapter. You're gonna to need to keep in mind the importance of developing a speech with the effective introduction and effective body. If you have these elements, you have a good foundation, you need to be able to conclude effectively. Just as a good introduction helps bring an audience member into the world of your speech, a good speech body holds the audience in that world. A good conclusion helps bring the audience member back to reality outside your speech. In this section, we're going to examine the function fulfilled, the conclusion of a speech. A strong conclusion serves as a signal, this, the end of the speech, and to help your listeners remember your speech. Signals the end. The first thing is a good conclusion that can signal the end of a speech. You may be thinking that slowing the audience that you're about to stop speaking is no-brainer, but many speakers really don't prepare for the audience for the end. When the speaker suddenly stops speaking, the audience is left confused and disappointed. Instead, we want to make sure the audience is, are left knowledgeable and satisfied with our speeches. Steps of a conclusion. We'll explain in great detail about how to ensure that you will signal the end of your speech in a matter that's both effective and powerful. Aids audience's memory of your speech. The second reason is a good conclusion stems out of very interesting research reported the German psychologist Hermann Eges back in 1885 in his book, Memory, A Contribution to Experimental Psychology. Eges proposed that humans remember information in a linear fashion, which he called the theoretical effect. He found an individual's ability to remember information in the list, like a grocery list, a chores list, or to-do list. It depends on the location of the item on the list. Specifically, he found the items left toward the top of the list and items toward the bottom of the list tended to have the highest recall rates. The zero position basically finds the information at the beginning of the list. And privacy. And are easier to recall than information in the middle of the list. So what does this have to do with conclusions? A lot. Ray Eisenberg wanted to test a serial position effect in the public speaking. And ever created an experiment that rearranged the ordering of a speech to determine the recall information. Innsbruck's study 
reaffirm the importance of primary and recency when listening to speeches. In fact, Eisenberg found that the information delivered during the conclusion recency had the highest level of, of recall or all overall. A strong conclusion is very important because a speaker's final chance to really explain the importance of his or her message is allow the speaker to both signal the end of a speech and help the audience remember the main ideas. As such, speakers need to thoroughly examine how they would conclude their speeches with power. The serial position is the effect, the area that people need to remember ideas that are stated either first primary or last recency in the list the most. It's important in speech conclusions because restating your main ideas helps you take advantage of the recency effect and helps your audience remember your ideas. Why conclusions matter? Well, we just talked about it. We discussed the importance of conclusion it has on a speech. In this section, we're going to examine the three steps in building an effective conclusion. Hold on one moment. We are going to watch a video on that. Can you believe we're almost, well, we're more than halfway through the course. So congratulations to you. Hung in there. Remember, if you're behind on your work, you can go back and you can go ahead and update your work. Okay. All right. Okay, this is how you can sound smart. And even though we're not doing a TED Talk, we are speaking and it's good to sound smart. Searching for a better way to collaborate with your Sorry, team? Marcia. Try Miro, an online whiteboard. Hear that? That's nothing. Which is what I, as a speaker at today's conference, have for you all. I have nothing. Nada. Zip. Zilch. Zippo. Nothing smart. Nothing inspirational. Nothing even remotely researched at all. I have absolutely nothing to say whatsoever. And yet, through my manner of speaking, I will make it seem like I do. <laughs> like what I am saying is brilliant. And maybe, just maybe, you will feel like you've learned something. Now, I'm going to get started with the opening. I'm going to make a lot of hand gestures. I'm going to do this with my right hand. I'm going to do this with my left. I I'm going to adjust my glasses. And then I'm going to ask you all a question. Uh, by show of hands, how many of you all have been asked a question before? Okay, great, I'm seeing some hands. And again, I have nothing here. <laughs> now, I'm going to react to that and act like I'm telling you a personal anecdote. Something to break the tension. Something to endear myself a little bit. Something kind of uh, embarrassing. <laughs> and you guys are going to make an awe sound. Aww. It's true. It really happened. <laughs> and now I'm going to bring it to a broader point. I'm going to reel you back in. I'm going to make it intellectual. I'm going to bring it to this man right here. Now, what this man did was important, I'm sure. But I, for one, have no idea who he is. I simply Google image the word scientist. And now, you see, I'd like it to seem like I'm making points, building an argument, inspiring you to change your life. When in reality, this is just me buying time. Now, 
if you don't believe me, let's take a look at the numbers. This is a real thing that's happening right now. <laughs> the number of talks that I'm giving is one. <laughs> Interesting facts imparted thus far in said talk, well, that's going to be a zero. <laughs> My height in inches is 70.5. Note the point five there. 2 times 6 equals 12, and then interestingly enough, 6 times 2 also equals 12. That's math. <laughs> 352 is a three-digit number. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then almost immediately following that, we get 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. <laughs> now, to add more filler here, I'm going to give you a couple more numbers to consider. Uh, 18, 237, 5,601, 2.6 million. Four, four, 24, staggering. These are real numbers, all of them. And to follow that up, let's take a look at some graphs. Now, if you take a look at this pie chart, what you're going to see is that the majority far exceeds the minority. Everybody see that? Cool, isn't it? And let's take a look at this bar graph, because it shows similarly irrelevant data. Now, I'm doing this because I'd like to make it seem like I've done my homework. If you were, say, watching this on YouTube with the sound off, you might think, huh, OK, this guy knows what he's talking about. But I don't. I'm floundering, panicking, I've got nothing. I'm a total and utter phony. But you know what? I was offered a TED Talk. And damn it, I'm going to see it through. <laughs> now, if you take a look behind me, these are just words paired with vaguely thought-provoking stock photos. I'm going to point at them like I'm making use both of my time as well as your time, but in reality, I don't know what half of them mean. And now, as these continue, I'm just going to start saying gibberish. Wagga wa, gabba gabba, turkey, mouth in a mouth, chip, trip, my dog skip, rip it and dip it, Richard. I'm an itty bitty baby bopper, and I'm hungry in my tum tum. Brad Pitt, Uma Thurman. Names, things, words, words, and more things. And see, it feels like it might make sense, doesn't it? Like maybe, just maybe, I'm building to some sort of satisfying conclusion. I mean, I'm gesticulating as though I am. I'm pacing, I'm growing in intensity, I'm taking off my glasses, which, by the way, are just frames. <laughs> I wore them to look smart, even though my vision is perfect. <laughs> and now I'm going to slow things down a little bit. I'm going to change the tone. I'm going to make it seem like I'm building to a moment. And what if I was? <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? What can you do? Life's a roller coaster. You know, <laughs> if there's one thing you take away from my talk, I'd like you to think about what you heard at the beginning, and I'd like you to think about what you hear now. Because it was nothing, and it's still nothing. Think about that. <laughs> or don't, that's fine. And now I'm going to stop talking. Thank you. All right, so it's all about how you make yourself, how you make yourself noticeable, how you start and how you end, and do you keep the audience occupied. This is the magic of words, what we speak is what we create by Andrew. I don't see how we can grow unless we up our game on social media. I don't have time. A magician for over 45 years. When I was 23 years old, I met former US presidential candidate Ross Perot and I ended up working for him for 10 years. Ross made me promise that I'd figure out a way to integrate magic and business, and I've been working at that for the last 30 years. So tonight I'm here to share with you one of the greatest secrets that I discovered on that 30-year journey. <coughs> tonight we're gonna pull back the curtain, and I'm gonna share with you one of magic's greatest secrets. This is so secret that most magicians don't know it. This is a real treasure to me. And when I first discovered it, 
I didn't want to share it with anyone, seriously. I wanted to keep it for myself. But it had such a big impact on my life. And as I started to share it with other people, people were telling me how it was impacting them. And so it's clearly one of those ideas worth sharing. So that's why I'm here tonight. The secret is a magic word that has transformational power. In fact, it's the universal magic word, and you all know it. What's the universal magic word? Abracadabra. <laughs> Please is a very good magic word. <laughs> and thank you. So I never used the word abracadabra in my magic performances. I thought it was goofy. I thought it was just some nonsense word. But one day I was sitting and I was reflecting and I thought, where does abracadabra come from and what does it mean? And so I started to do some research and it led me to the uh, Department of Linguistics at MIT. I sent an email, I had a follow-up phone conversation. A couple days later, one of the faculty called and said, you aren't gonna believe this. Abracadabra is an Aramaic word. I said, what's Aramaic? He said, Aramaic is an ancient sacred language that predates Hebrew. Some people say Aramaic is the language that Jesus spoke. But he said, hold on, because you're never going to believe what abracadabra means. It means what I speak is what I create. What I speak is what I create. Let me give you an example of abracadabra in action. We're going to start, what I speak is what I create. We have to begin with words. So we're going to take a simple word, the word ball. And let's just add another word, the word bowling. Abra, Cadabra. <laughs> Truly, what I speak is what I create. Words are one of our most powerful sources of creative power. Words can ignite a movement. Words can inspire us to rise above adversity. Words can connect our hearts. On the other hand, words can destroy creativity. Words can take us down a rat hole of self-doubt. And words can destroy relationships. We all know how powerful words are, and yet it's scary how little attention we pay to our words. We don't realize how powerful our words are in terms of influencing the results that we're getting in life. Words are so powerful. And so tonight, I'm going to equip you by using this idea of abracadabra to use your words more consciously so that you can move toward what you want to create, so that you can become more collaborative, more innovative, more creative. You can look at obstacles in different ways. And so that you can transform your life, your relationship, your teams, your workplace. Abracadabra is a powerful tool for doing this. I want you to think about your words in, in two ways, creative or limiting. Are your words creative? Are they uplifting? Are they inspiring? Are they generative? Or are they negative? Are they destructive? Are they demoralizing? Now, just understanding this distinction between creative and limiting 
can be a really powerful tool for you. It may sound really elementary, but just being conscious, are my words, are the words that I'm using right now moving me towards what I want, or are they moving me towards what I don't want? And just by being conscious, you can do kind of an abracadabra on yourself and say, wait a minute, what I speak is what I create. I want to be using words that are moving me towards what I want to create. So let's look at this idea of abracadabra uh, on three levels. We'll look at it on a personal level, on an interpersonal level, and from a leadership perspective. First, the personal level. Raise your hand if you talk to yourself. Now, you, you hesitated for a moment. I, I kind of saw you look up, and that leads me to believe you were thinking, do I talk to myself? <laughs> of course you do. We all do. We all talk to ourselves. We have this constant churning, constant stream of thought going. And if you don't believe me, just try meditating. You get quiet. You close your eyes, and immediately it starts. Did I leave the coffee maker on? It starts. And we just have that constant stream going on. In the uh, world of magic, the magician's script is called patter, and it's carefully designed words that influence what you believe and what you see. And that internal patter that we all have going on is similar. It's there to influence what we believe and what we see and consequently what we end up creating in life. Let me tell you a, a story about that internal patter. When I was a kid growing up practicing magic in our farmhouse in the basement in Michigan, I learned about an organization called the Magic Circle in London. The Magic Circle is the oldest society of magicians in the world. And I set a goal at age 14 to become a member. 25 years later, I was invited. Now, to become a member, you have to pass an audition in front of 140 of the best magicians in the world who know how you're doing what you're doing. It's very intimidating. And so about two weeks before my audition, I was doing a workshop for uh, a company in Chicago. And it was a two-day workshop. It was about 100 people. And I thought, this is a perfect opportunity for me to rehearse for my audition. So first day, I step out in front of the group. And I start to perform a trick. And I screw it up royally. I mean, so bad that people in the audience were going, oh, so that's how you do that. <laughs> and it shook me up a little bit, but I just, you know, rolled with it and went on with the workshop. Day two, I stepped out again, different trick, started to perform it, and I failed again. Now, I was really shaken up this time. It was two weeks before the audition of my life, and I had failed at two magic tricks that I'd performed my entire life for, for decades. So I was so shaken, I stepped aside, and I asked one of my colleagues to step in for me. He gets up in front of the group, and in front of 100 people, he looks over at me and he says, what's going on with you? I've never seen you fail at a trick. And I was very humbled by having failed, and I took his question to heart, and I just thought for a moment, and I realized, and I announced it to everyone, I said, I don't believe I'm good enough to become a member of the Magic Circle. And my friend lovingly looked over at me, and he said, abracadabra, what you speak is what you create. I had this script running in my head that was so powerful it worked its way out of my head and into my hands. And so I set to work rewiring my brain. I spent the next two weeks, every morning I'd take 20 minutes, and I'd sit and I would write a first, 
in-person accounting of what my audition was going to look like, what it was going to feel like, and it was all as positive as it could be. You know, I can feel the energy from the group. They want me to succeed, that kind of thing. I did that every day for two weeks. I went to London. I did my audition. And I'm happy to say that I've been a member of the Magic Circle for the last 14 years. Thank you. I'm kind of a big deal. <laughs> and so, you know, skills and knowledge are required. But oftentimes they're not sufficient. Oftentimes it's the inner game that gets in the way. You still have to have the skills and the knowledge. But sometimes what we have going on up here works its way out. And what we speak is what we create. Now, that story points out another uh, aspect of abracadabra. And that's using it on an interpersonal level. My friend, by simply saying abracadabra, what you speak is what you create, made me awake. And it was something I had been blind to, suddenly, thanks to a friend, I was aware of it. And that's what we can do for each other. Think about if you had that kind of relationship with people at work, where we would help each other o overcome these kind of self-limiting words and thoughts that we tend to use. My wife, Jennifer, uh, created these wristbands and they say, abracadabra, what I speak is what I create. And I wear mine all the time. And I'll be looking, I'll be working, and I'll look down, and I'll notice it. And it's a chance for me to, to just kind of check. I took the first quarter of this year, and I'm writing a book, so I would write every morning. And there was a morning where I was writing, and I was stuck kind of the classic writer's block. And I looked down and I saw my abracadabra wristband. And I just paused and I thought, OK, what am I running in my head right now? And I realized that I had this belief that I don't have anything worthwhile that anyone wants to hear. And I just thought, that's not getting me towards what I want to get. And I just did a quick shift. Jennifer and I use it at home with each other. One of us will go down a rat hole. And uh, the other one will, will say, abracadabra. And it's just lighthearted. It's quick. It's fun. It's easy. It doesn't take years of therapy. It's just quick like that. Jennifer tells me that I'm rather condescending when I use it. You know, <laughs> abracadabra. <laughs> and so that, that interpersonal kind of helping each other, Jennifer and I, um, work with a, a, an amazing organization in Alexandria, Virginia called the Friends of Guest House. And Guest House is a home for women coming out of prison. They go there, they stay for two or three months, and they find housing, they get jobs, they get their support communities established. Women who are coming out of prison have a 70% chance of going back to prison. Women who go through the Guest House program 7%. It's an amazingly effective program. And so we do workshops once a quarter with the women. And one of the things that we help them with is understanding the influence that your words have on your outcomes. And so we were at a social event. A bunch of us were standing around. And a young woman comes up. One of the, one of, they call them guests because it's guest house. One of the guests came up to us. And she said, you know, I'm taking my GED for the third time tomorrow. I'll probably fail it again. And one of her housemates reached over, because this young woman was wearing her abracadabra wristband, and her housemate reaches over and she snaps it. And she says, abracadabra, honey, what you speak is what you create. And this young woman's eyes got really big, and she said, oh, yeah. You know, I've been studying a lot. I will pass this time. And she did. What she spoke is what she created. On a leadership level, words are so critical because leaders, I think, want, in my experience, I've been working with organizations going through transformation for the last 30 years. That's what I do. I use magic to teach leadership and help people shape 
really positive organizational cultures. And as I've worked with leaders, one of the most important things I've come to understand is that, that a leader, a great leader, creates hope. And one of the ways that they do that is they tell a story that's inspiring about where the organization is going. And they enable people to understand their role in the story, where they fit in, how their contribution is helping us create this amazing future. If you're a leader and your people don't understand and aren't inspired about where you're going and they don't see their place in it, then you're not leading. Jack Dorsey is one of the co-founders of Twitter and the current CEO of Square, you know, the mobile device that you swipe credit cards. He says that one of his primary jobs is to be the editor-in-chief of the Square story. He's the steward of moving that story forward in such a way that people are inspired by it and that they feel connected to it. So, in closing, I want to give you some action steps for putting Abracadabra to work. First of all, just simply be aware. Are the words you're using, are they creative or are they limiting? Just be aware. Second, monitor your internal language as well as your external language. Use Abracadabra as a quick tool to notice when you're not using words that are moving you towards the future you want to create and just abracadabra, make a shift. Fourth, when you see results that aren't the results that you want, just do a little reflection, do a little examination under the surface and consider whether or not the words that you're running, the patter that's going on, maybe is getting in the way. And last, journal about what it is that you're trying to create. Do like I did with the Magic Circle audition. Write about what the future looks like in vivid detail. Write about it until it makes you smile. That's kind of a test. So in closing, I want to leave you with one word. And that word is prosperity. Prosperity comes from Latin, two words meaning pro Spera, it means toward hope. By choosing your words carefully, the words you use with yourself and with others, you can move toward hope. And I say that with a final abra cadabra. All right. At Groupon, we want Valentine's Day. Back to our book. So, oops, I'm sorry, I'm trying to share the book with you. I guess I bought out of it. We have review of the main points. After restating the speech's thesis, a second step in a powerful conclusion is to review the main points from your speech. One of the biggest differences between written and oral communication is the necessity of repetition of oral communication. When we preview our main points in the introduction, effectively discuss and make transitions to our main points during the body of the speech and finally, the review of the main points in the conclusion. We increase the likelihood the audience will retain our main points after the speech is over. In the introduction speech, we deliver a preview of our body points. And in conclusion, we deliver a review. Let's look at a sample preview. In order to understand the field of gender and communication, I will first differentiate between terms of biological sex and gender. I will then explain the history of the gender research and communication Lastly, we will examine a series of important findings related to gender and communications. In this preview, we will have uh, three clear points. Let me see if we can review them in the conclusion. So here we go. Today, I have differentiated between the terms of biological sex and gender, examine the history of the, the research, 
of Gender Research and Communication Analyze series of research findings on the topic. In the past few years, I have explained the difference between the terms of biological sex and gender, discussed the rise of gender research in the field of communication, examined a series of groundbreaking studies in the field. Notice that both the conclusions review the main points generally set forth. Both variations are equally effective reviews of the main points, but you might like the linguistic turn of one over the other. Remember, there is a lot of science to help us understand public speaking. There's a lot of art as well. So if you're always encouraged to choose the wording that you think will be effective for your audience. Concluding device. The final part is powerful conclusion is the concluding device. A concluding device is essentially the final thought you want your audience members to have when they stop speaking. It also provides a, a definitive sense of closure in your speech. One of the authors in the text often makes the analogy between gymnastics dismount and concluding device in a speech, just as a gymnast dismounting the parallel bars or a balance beam wants to stick landing and avoid taking two or three steps. A speaker wants to stick the ending with the presentation by ending with concluding device instead of with. Well, um, I guess I'm done. Miller observed that speakers tend to use one of the 10 concluding devices when ending a speech. The rest of the section is going to examine 10 concluding devices. Conclude with a challenge. The first way Miller found that some speakers end their speeches is with a challenge. A challenge is a call to engage in some kind of activity that requires a contest or special effort. In a speech on the necessity of fundraising, a speaker can conclude by challenging an audience to raise 10% more than their original projections. In a speech on eating more vegetables, you can ch chain, uh, challenge your audience to increase their current intake of vegetables by two portions a day daily. In these challenges, audience members are being asked to go out of the way to do something different that involves the effort on their part. Conclude with a quotation. The second way you can conclude a speech is by reciting quotation relevant to the speech topic. When using a quotation, you need to think about whether your goal is to end on a persuasive note or an informative note. Some quotations have a clear call to action, while other quotations summarize or provoke it. For example, let's just say you're delivering an informative speech about a dissent writers of the former Soviet Union. You can end by citing a quotation from Alexander Shorson. A great writer is, so to speak, a second government in his country, and for that reason, no regime has ever loved great writers. Notice this quotation underscores the idea of writers as dissents, but it doesn't ask listeners to put forth the effort to engage in any specific thought process or behavior. If on the other hand, you were delivering a persuasive speech urging your audience to participate in a very risky political demonstration, you might use a quotation from Martin Luther King. If a man hasn't discovered something that he will die for, he can't fit to live. These are real quotes. In this case, quotation leaves the audience with a message that great risk are worth taking and they make our lives worthwhile and they're the right thing to do. Go ahead and take great risk. Conclude with a summary. When a speaker ends a summary, he or she is simply elongating a review of main points. While this may be the most exciting concluding device, it can be useful information that is highly technical or complex or for speeches lasting longer than 30 minutes. Typically for short speeches like those in your class, the summary device should be avoided. You can conclude by visualizing the future. The purpose of the conclusion that refers to the future is to help your audience imagine the future you believe you can occur. You're giving the speech a development of video games for learning. You can conclude by depicting the classroom of the future where the video games are perceived as a true learning tools and how these tools can be utilized. More often, speakers use the visualization of a future to depict how society would be or how individual listeners' lives would be different. If a speaker persuade attempt worked, for example, if a speaker proposes that a solution to literacy is hiring more reading specialists in public schools, the speaker could ask her or his audience to imagine a world without literacy. In the use of visualization, the tool is to persuade people to adopt the speaker's point of view. By showing the speaker's vision of the future is a positive one, the conclusion should help persuade the audience to help in the future. 
Conclude with appeal to action. Probably the most common persuasive concluding device is the appeal for action or the call to action. In essence, the appeal for action occurs when a speaker asks her or his audience to engage in a specific behavior or change in thinking. When a speaker concludes by asking the audience to do or to think in a specific manner, the speaker wants to see actual change. Whether the speaker appeals for people to eat more fruit or buy a car, vote for candidate opposites, the death penalty or seeing more in the shower, the speaker is asking the audience to engage in action. One specific type of appeal for action is immediate call to action. Where some people ask for people to engage in behavior in the future, the immediate call to action asks people to engage in the behavior right away. If a speaker wants to see a new traffic light placed in a dangerous intersection here, she might conclude by asking the audience to sign a digital petition. That is a great idea. I remember when I was a student and I was working on my associate degree and I was really young, I was like 18 or 19 years old, I remember doing a speech. I was in a speech club. I actually got voted the most improved speaker, but I was in a speech club and I actually got to present a presentation. And back then we didn't have PowerPoint. So I did that on like a giant piece of uh, poster board I got from Dollar Tree. And I drew a little diagraph of this intersection called di the Los Coyotes Diagonal. And it was in Long Beach, California. And they didn't have a street light. And I said it was really dangerous because people were coming from different directions. And I was giving a scenario that there could be car accidents. And there was car accidents. And I also told them about another place. It was called the traffic circle. But traffic circle today still does not have a traffic light. But I will tell you, the Las Coyotes Diagonal does. Now they have a shopping center there. And they also have a high school right there on the corner. So yes, now they actually do have street lights. But that was like, it was my idea. I like to think that maybe I did that speech that day and somebody who's now maybe in their 30s or 40s heard my speech. Maybe they're walking through the corridors and heard me speaking or they sat there and listened. It was a great experience. And I like to think that maybe I helped make a difference that maybe they grew up and they were part of the city council or they were part of planning or they were maybe in civic engineering and they heard my speech and they made a change. I like to think that. I don't know. It could just be somebody with the same ideas I have and he or she has those access to making change. And I don't. I was just a voice giving a speech. Or maybe I gave a speech and gave somebody ideas and they shared with someone else and then they're the ones that can make a difference. So who knows? But your words are important. Just like the video we just watched, your words are very, very important. And if we are using our words and we're encouraging people, you never know we're going to make a difference. We could be doing something simple, like in a speech on eating more vegetables, pass out raw vegetables and dip them, you know, at the conclusion of the speech. In a speech pertaining to lawmaker new speech, you can provide audience members with a pre-written email they can send to the lawmaker. In a speech on the importance of using hand sanitizer, you can hand out little bottles of hand sanitizers and show the audience members how to correctly apply the hand sanitizer. You could do a speech about asking for donations to charity, send a box around the room asking for donations. That's a great idea. I was just talking with somebody and I was telling her that I was upset because Goodwill four times now has pretty much deemed my stuff is not good enough. I remember I was moving from my apartment. This is years ago, this was 2005. And they came out and I had like brand new stuff with still the tags on it. And they threw it in the dumpster because they said that they could only take one desk lamp. They're brand new desk lamps. And they just threw it in the trash. So that's when I realized like, why does my mom keep wanting to donate to them? Then we donated like three more times and they did the same thing. They just threw it outside. This last time was when I moved in October. My dad donated some things and he said they just put it on the side and the next, you know, some homeless people were taking it, which is good. I mean, at least someone's taking it. So where I live right now, it's a mixed community. Like I live in a house, I own my own house. But there's a lot of people that rent. We have a lot of section eight and low income housing. We have like section eight apartments. A lot of people are really having a hard time social economically finding work, keeping work, uh, being able to pay their bills. They're disabled. A lot of them are veterans. So I think it's great. We have some food banks here. And then my friend just told me that they, they just opened two free clothing boutiques. So instead of being like a Goodwill where you have to pay for the item and that makes me mad. Like I paid for the item and I gave it to Goodwill and they're, they're like telling me my stuff's not good enough or they're selling it for like more than I probably paid for it. 
then I don't think that's cool. I mean, I'll buy stuff at Goodwill. I bought some clothes there before. I bought eight pairs of jeans there and I bought like four pairs of boots there and a couple of t-shirts. So, I mean, I will go in there and buy stuff. I bought a couple other things, some face masks, like, you know, like uh, Halloween ones. I bought some, some tape. I bought some aluminum foil. So they sell like things at Target like old stuff from Target because I saw the Target labels on them. So I've got like brand new stuff from Target, like 25 cent journals, you know, from Target. And I think that's great, you know, but I kind of am like, hmm, maybe I shouldn't donate my stuff if they're going to act that way. But this place takes everything and they give it to people for free. And their website says no questions asked. You need free clothing? Come to our boutique. Everything is free on these two days, Tuesday and Thursday. No questions asked, no money needed. I think that's great because if somebody donates it, they want to make sure it's going to cost. And they also have a food bank too. My friend's husband is a pastor and they're like 30 minutes from here. And he has a food bank also he does food bank on monday and friday so community people can come and get free food no questions asked i think that's great that's part of being a, a wonderful person i know being christ-like we should be giving to others if we have extra then share in the bible there's lots of people that shared and i think that's great we we should still have that compassion whether it was uh thousands of years ago or today in 2022 also we can conclude by inspiration by definition, the word inspire means to affect or arouse someone. Both affect and arouse have strong emotional connotations. The ultimate goal of an inspiration concluding device is similar to appeal for action. But the ultimate goal is lofty and ambiguous. The goal is to stir someone's emotions in a particular manner. Maybe a speaker is giving an informative speech or a prevalence of domestic violence in society today. That speaker could end with a speech by reading Paulette Kelly's powerful poem, I Got Flowers Today. I Got Flowers Today is a poem that evokes strong emotions because it's about an abuse victim who refuse, who receives flower from an abuser every time she's victimized. And the poem ends by saying, I got flowers today. It was a special day. It was my funeral. Last night, he killed me. So that's very sad. And instead of getting help, he just gives her flowers. And the last flowers, it was the one that she died. Very sad. And yes, men can have domestic violence too. Domestic violence could be a woman on a man. I knew Matt told me that his ex-wife used to hit him, but she also was 300 pounds too. And he's probably like 150. And also same sex too. Or even we know that it could happen with anyone. We conclude with this advice. The next colluding device is one that should be primarily used by speakers who are recognized as experts in authority and given on the subject. Advice is essentially a speaker's opinion about when, what should and should not be done. The, opinion, the problem with opinion is that everybody has one and one person's opinion is not necessarily any more important than another. There should be really good reason for your opinion and therefore your advice should matter to your audience. If, for example, you're an expert of a nuclear physicist, you might conclude a speech on the energy by giving advice to the benefits of the nuclear energy. Conclude by proposing a solution. Another way a speaker can conclude a powerful speech is to offer a solution to the problem discussed in the chapter. For example, perhaps the speaker has been discussing a problem with the disappearance of art education in the United States. The speaker could propose a solution of creating more community-based art experiences for school children as a way to fill in the gap. Although this can be effective conclusion, a speaker must ask herself or himself whether solutions should be discussed in the depth of a standalone point within the body of a speech so the audience concerns about proposed solutions be addressed. Conclude with a question. Another way you can end the speech is to ask for a rhetorical question that forces the audience to ponder the idea. Maybe you're given a speech on the importance of the environment. So you can end the speech by saying, think about your child's future. What kind of world would you want them raised in them? A world that's clean, vibrant, or beautiful, or one that's filled with smog, pollution, filth, and disease. Notice that you're actually asking the audience to verbally or non-verbally answer the question. The goal of this question is to force the audience into thinking about what kind of world they want for their children. And you can conclude by reference to the audience. 
The last concluding device discussed by Miller, 1946, was a reference to one's audience. This concluding device is when a speaker attempts to answer the basic audience question, what is in it for me? The goal of this concluding device is to spell out the direct benefits of the behavior or the change that has audience members. For example, a speaker talking about stress reduction techniques can conclude by clearly listing all the physical health benefits stress reduction offers, improved flexes, improved immune system, improved hearing, reduction in blood pressure, in this case, the speaker is clearly spelling out the audience should care, and it should, and it wasn't for them. We have informative versus persuasive. So as you read through these possible questions, conclude a speech. Hopefully you notice some of the methods are appropriate for persuasive speeches and others appropriate for informative speeches. To help you choose appropriate conclusions, persuasive or entertaining. Here's some questions. Let's see, hmm, challenge. Could be either one, quotation, Summary, visualize in the future, appeal, inspiration, advice, and proposal of solution, question, and reference. We could have smart dust. We talked about that last week. Today, we explored how smart dust may impact our lives in the future by examining what smart dust is, how smart dust could be utilized lies by the US military, how smart dust could impact our lives sooner rather than later. While smart dust is quickly transforming from science fiction to science facts, experts agree the full potential of smart dust will probably not occur till 2025. Wow, that's only four years away or three years away. While smart dust is definitely coming, swarms of smart dust eating people as depicted in Michael Creighton's 2002 prey aren't reality. So remember we read this last week? So we have the conclusion here, the analysis. In your turn. Now that you have seen the above analysis of a speech conclusion, we encourage you to do similar analysis of conclusion of other speeches. Listen to speech in your classroom or online. Does it end with the restatement of the thesis, a review of the main points and a concluding device? Can you? Suggest ways to improve conclusion? Here's another try. Consider the specific purpose and three main points of a hypothetical speech. Based on those components, you could even develop your own speech. All right, it's all about using our words. This is uh, winning words, the phrases that pay. This is for you. If that's not. I was born with my left eye permanently closed. What it meant is that my life was always in the medical area. I start, they started plastic surgery on me at age two. I didn't really realise I had a problem until I got to school. When I got to school, I discovered that kids are so creative when it comes to name calling. I mean, there were a hundred awful names that I got, but two that I heard nearly every day. They would say, Lisa, you are so ugly and you look dumb. I was five. Where did they get this stuff from? I would run home to my mother. I remember just throwing myself into her arms and saying, Mum, it's not fair. And my beautiful mother, who knew all about life not being fair, 13th child raised by her grandmother, grabbed my little face and pulled me in really close, looked deep into my eyes and said, Life's not fair. <laughs> I said, is that it? She said, no. She said, if you don't like it, don't do it to others. I said, that's not fair. She said, correct. <laughs> I love the fact that my mother taught me at a young age one of the most important relationship skills we can have.
and that is life is as fair as we make it for one another. Life is as fair as you make it for the person next to you and for the person that you're thinking that you might like to put a little bit of effort into in the future. Life is as fair as we make it. But she did happen to mention, she said, sweetheart, your father and I think you're very smart. I said, pretty would have been better. <laughs> but smart's not bad. So when I got to school and the kids would say, you're ugly, I would stand there and quietly say to myself, but I'm smart. My mum says so. I've got to tell you, hundreds and hundreds of times throughout my primary schooling did I tell myself that I was something that was spoken over me. I'm smart. I'm smart. I'm smart. You might say I'm dumb, but I'm smart. Do you understand that a child starts to move in the direction of their dominant thought? And my behaviour changed. I started to ask more questions, put my hand up. I started to be eager to learn because something was happening inside of me. I was believing that I truly was smart. And it's interesting because I went to a girls' school in secondary school and they moved some of the girls. When we got to year 12, the girls that were doing the science subjects and maths were moved from the girls' school into the boys' school. So just imagine, please, 13 girls moving in with 186 year 12 boys. <laughs> heaven, heaven. I mean, it was heaven for the other girls, but it was hell for me. Because halfway through the school year, three of my supposedly good male friends scratched on my locker a new name. They wrote this for all 800 boys to read. Good on you, bung eye. I was devastated. I felt like the boys had just taken a knife and plunged it into me and say, what you look like is what you are and you can't change it. I wanted to scream out and say, can't you see there's more to me than meets the eye? <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't think of that line. <laughs> and I said nothing. All the conversation was in my head. And I got out of their way. I got on with my studies. And... I just tried to come to grips with what you did with a new name like that. End of year school social came. Well, I did what single girls sometimes do. I sort of sat a little bit out of the way and I just picked out the cutest guy in the room and I just followed him with my eyes. And if he'd look at me, I'd look away. And then I'd find him again and I'd just follow him around the room. He'd look at me, I'd look away. Two and a half hours of light entertainment. <laughs> at the end of the night, that young man courageously walked all the way from the far corner across the dance floor right up in front of me and stuck his hand out. He said, hello, I just wanted to introduce myself to you. I've noticed that you've been winking at me all night. <laughs> I thought I had a handicap. <laughs> I had a built-in asset. <laughs> but you need to understand that for 17 years, I had allowed people to laugh at me. It was this young man that revealed that I could actually get people to laugh with me instead of at me. If I would be brave enough to point out my differences, my little uniqueness before other people got to it, then I would allow everyone to relax with my little insecurity. Do you know, when I accept myself and speak words of acceptance over me, then I make it easier for you to do the same thing. And when we are together, we make it easier for others to come into our circle and accept one another. The words are so important and the lightness and the sense of humour. The most important words that you will ever hear in your whole life are the words you say 
to yourself about yourself. What do you need to be saying? At this age, at this stage of your life, what do you need to label you? What are the words that you wear every single day over your life like a banner? Did you put them there or did somebody else put them there? If you're going to change these words, you're going to need what I, to do what I did, and that is go into training. So let me just show you how I did that. Everyone just stand up, please, for a moment. I want you to bend your knees to 45 degrees. So like this. That's right. Now, you don't bounce. Just, just don't stick your bottom out. Make your back straight and push your knees over your toes until you can feel the stress on this muscle group. These are called the quadriceps. They pump almost more blood to the brain than any other muscle group. This is a fantastic position for learning environments. <laughs> you cannot fall asleep in this position. <laughs> and what this position is really called is pain. <laughs> now, some of you have just realised that it's starting to hurt. But we are the TEDx crowd. We are into growth. So we aren't going to stand up. We're going to go 10% beyond pain. Down you come. <laughs> now, this is called agony. <laughs> come back 10%. Isn't pain easy after agony? <laughs> oh, he's not convinced. Down again. <laughs> See, it's hard to live like this. It's hard to sustain this and take a seat. Thank you. Pain. Pain has a purpose. Pain is not in our life just to make us miserable. Pain is part of the training. Pain is taking us, forcing us sometimes out of our comfort zone and moving us towards where we want to go. It is going to take effort. The name calling was agony. But pain is the discipline it takes to move my head from what other people said to what I want to say. And that's how I started to take my message to teenagers. It, I was 26 years old and I said, well, I, I'm going to say it was a wild, hairy, audacious goal. It was way out there when I said to my parents, I am going to help a million Aussie teenagers. I'm going to teach them how to dream, break the dream down and set some goals and solve problems along the way. And fortunately for me, I had parents that were dreamers and they said, why don't you just get started? And you know, I started to go into schools and I was a terrible speaker. And the kids would throw paper aeroplanes across the classroom in the middle of my presentation. But I understood I was in training. It wasn't going to be easy. There was going to be discomfort. And I would need to find a way to learn how to take what was in my heart for these people and put it out in a way that they could receive it. Little did I know that going into the schools of Australia would then catapult me into the corporate conferences of this country and eventually around the world. The adults who loved the message would take me to places that I had never even dreamed of. Places like Russia and Israel and Africa. And I remember thinking, how did I get here? How did this happen? And I just look back and think about all the training I did in my quiet, private place in my own home, in my own life, learning the words that would help me to win, help me to win in relationships, help me to win in sport, help me to win in just the way I did life. And, and I want to share with you three phrases that pay. I've got a top 10 of these, but I want to give you three today that I hope you're going to be able to use all day. The first phrase is one that you probably need when you've got very, very irritated, annoyed or angry. Now, I don't know what you say when you're angry, but I got my um, 
temperament tested when someone cuts me off on the freeway. You know, don't tell me what comes out of your mouth. But what came out of my mouth wasn't so lovely because the two children in the car seats behind me repeated it perfectly. So I went, all right, this is not working for my family. I need new vocabulary. And so I tried to come up with a word. What could I say when I'm really, really angry? And then I came up with it. A nice, long, four-syllable word. Fascinating. <laughs> that driver was fascinating. <laughs> How many of you need a word like this? Everybody say the word three times, go. Fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. Now notice what it does to you. It releases a little tension. It takes a little time. It gives you a moment to laugh at yourself and it lightens you up. So every time that I would say fascinating, the kids would repeat it so I'd get the double benefit. But I started to realise that instead of me moving towards road rage, I moved towards self-control, a light-heartedness, and an ability to turn the situation from a negative to a little bit of fun. So fascinating has been a friend of mine. And you know, I've got to say that sometimes I'll look at my children and say, they're fascinating. <laughs> and even my husband has been known to accuse me of being fascinating. <laughs> and it's not a negative word. That's just the point, isn't it? It's just a word and it gives release to a particular type of feel. So let me give you phrase number two. Phrase number two is ideal for sport. Now, I've grown up in a family with professional tennis players. My dad, semi-professional. My two brothers, professional. Oh, I guess all the talent was gone by the time they got to me. So when I was on learning to play tennis, my coordination was absolutely terrible. I mean, my dad used to stand out on the road and throw me balls. And he would throw and I would miss. And he would throw and I would miss. And well, we'd just go through a whole bucket of balls. And then as we picked up the balls, my dad would say to me, it's really fun playing tennis with you, Lisa. <laughs> One day, you're going to be a very good tennis player. Now, notice, my father was in his heyday. My father was giving equal time to his daughter who showed no talent and my father spoke words of life over me. He told me it was a delight to be with me and that the future would get better. And I'm very, very grateful because for six months he threw buckets of balls before I ever connected. I was looking like a lost cause. Last season, we won our first A-grade midweek competition. And you know, sometimes you wait 30 years, doesn't matter. <laughs> So all I want you to see is that the phrases that pay count so much. Third phrase, oh no, the phrase that we need that I didn't teach you is that what you've got to do is when you've run and you've actually decided that you've missed the ball, you've made a mistake, you say, that's not like me. Everyone say it, please. <laughs> now, you could look at the person next to you and say, that's not like you either. <laughs> so we need these phrases. And the third phrase is, I'm sorry, I was wrong and you were right. <laughs> yes, it's like chewing glass. <laughs> and all I want to say to you now is this, what's coming out of your mouth and what are you going to do about it? Thanks very much. Okay. <coughs> All right, moving on to the next chapter, chapter 12. Outlining. Outline is really important. There's different types of outline. It's fun to think of the outline. You want to think of an outline like a skeleton. You're going to assemble bone by bone. bone actually making it to take the form of a coherent whole. So think of it like a puzzle. It's which you put all the pieces in the correct places in order to see the full picture. Or think of the game as solitaire in which the right cards must follow a legitimate sequence in order for you to win. So 
the more fully you can come to understand the outline, it's both rule bound and creative. The more fully you experience its usefulness and its power to deliver your message in a unified, coherent way. This means, of course, that there are no shortcuts. There are helpful strategies. If you leave a bone out of a skeleton, something will fall apart. By the same token, if you omit a steep unreasoning, your speech will be vulnerable in lapses in logic, lapses in evidence you need to make your case, and the risk of becoming disjoined, disorientated message. When you're talking informally with friends, your conversion might follow a habitus course, but a public speaking must do so. What that means is might not. In prepared speech, you must be attentive in reasoning and logical steps as your audience understands the meaning you convey, and this is where your outline can help. In order for your speech to be effective as possible, it needs to be organized into logical patterns. Information will need to be presented in a way your audience can understand. This is especially true if you already know a great deal about your topic. You will need to take careful steps to include pertinent information your audience might not know and explain relationships that might not be evident to them. Using a standard outline format, you can make decisions about your main points, the specific information you wanna to use to support those points and the language you use. Without an outline, your message is liable to lose logical integrity. It might even deter deteriorate into a list of bullet points with no apparent connection to each other except the topic. Leaving your audience relieved when your speech is finally over. A full sentence outline lays a strong foundation for your message. It will call on you to have one clear and specific purpose in your message, as we have seen in the chapters of the book. Writing your specific purpose in clear language serves you as well. It helps you frame a clear, coherent thesis statement. It helps to exclude relevant information and it helps you focus only on information that directly bears on your thesis. It reduces the amount of research you must do. It suggests what kind of supporting evidence is needed. So less effort is expended in trying to figure out what to do next. It helps both you and your audience remember the central message of your speech. Finally, a solid full sentence outline helps your audience understand your message because it will be able to follow your reasoning. Remember that live audiences for oral communications lack the ability to rewind your message to figure out what you said. So it's critically important to help the audience follow your reasoning as it reaches their ears. Your authors have noted among their past and present students a reluctance to write full sentence outlines. Its task is to perceived as busy work, unnecessary, time consuming and restricted. On the other hand, we understand the reluctance. But on the other hand, we find students who are carefully to write full sentence outlines. They show a stronger tendency to give powerful presentations of excellent messages. Test scope the content. When you begin a clear con a concrete thesis statement, it acts kind of like a compass of your outline. Each main point should directly execute the thesis statement. The test of the scope will be a comparison of each main point and the thesis statement. If you find a, a poor match, you will know that you have wandered outside the scope of thesis. Let's say the general purpose of your speech is to inform and your broad area is wind generated energy. Now you must narrow it down to specific purpose. You have many choices, but let's just say your specific purpose is to inform a group of property owners about the economics of wind farms where electrical energy is generated. Your first main point could be the modern windmills require a very small land base, making the cost of real estate low. This is directly related to economics. All you need is information to support your claim that only a small land base is needed. <coughs> In your second point, you're going to be tempted to the claim of the windmills. They don't pollute and the other sources do. However, you will quickly note the claim is unrelated to the thesis. You must resist the temptation to add it. Perhaps in another speech, your thesis will address environmental impact. But in this speech, you're going to stay within the economic scope. Perhaps you will say that windmills are in place. They only require virtually no maintenance. This claim is related to the thesis. Now you need a supporting information to support your claim. Your third point, the point of the audience members they want to hear is the cost of generating electrical energy with windmills compared to other sources. This clearly is within the scope of your energy economics. You will have no difficulty finding these authoritative sources of the information to support your claim. When you write an outline form, it's much easier to test the scope of your content because you can visually locate specific information very easily and then check it against your thesis statement. 
test logical relation of your parts. You have many choices for your topic and therefore there are many ways your content can be lo logically organized. In the example above, we listed the main points that were important economic considerations about wind farms. Often the main points of the speech can be arranged into logical pattern. Let's take a look at these patterns. A chronological pattern arranges main points, main ideas in the order of the events to occur. In some instances, reverse order make sense. For instance, your topic is anarchically, you might use reverse order. Describing the newest artifacts first. A cause and effect pattern calls you to describe a specific situation and explain what the effect is. However, the most effects have more than one cause. Even dental cavities have multiple causes. It could be genetics, poor nutrition, teeth too tightly spaced, sugar, ineffective brushing, and so on. If you choose a cause and effect pattern, make sure you have enough reliable support to do the top the justice. Let's look down here. Test relevance is supporting ideas. When you create an outline, you can clearly see that you need supporting evidence for each of your main points. For instance, using the example above, your first main point claims that less land is needed for windmills than other utilities. Your supporting evidence should be about the amount of acreage required for windmill and the amount of acreage required for other energy situations. Okay, I'm gonna move it down. Your sources should come from experts in economics, economic development, and engineering. The evidence might even be an expert opinion, but not on the opinions of ordinary people. The expert opinion will provide stronger support for your point. Similarly, your second point claims the windmills turbine is in place. There's no virtually no maintenance cost. Your supporting evidence would show how much annual maintenance for a windmill costs and the costs are other energy plants. If you use a comparison with the nuclear plants to support your first main point, you would need to do again for the sake of consistency. It becomes very clear then that the third main point about the amount of electricity and the profitability needs authoritative references to compare it to the profit of the energy generated at the nuclear power plant. In the third main point, you would need to make the use of just a few well-selected statistics, authoritative sources to show the effectiveness of wind farms compared to other energy sources you've cited. Where do you find the kind of information that you would need to support the main points? A reference librarian can quickly guide you to authoritarian statistic manuals and help you make use of them. An important step is to notice that the full sentence outline includes this authoritative sources within the text. This is a major departure from the way you learn a write a speech paper. In the research paper, you can add the information to the end of the sentence, leaving the reader to turn the last page for further citation. In a speech, however, your listeners can't do that. From the beginning of the supporting point, you would need to fully cite your source so your audience can assess its importance. Because it's such a profound change in the economic habits that you're probably used to, you will have to make concerted effort to overcome the habits of the past and provide the information your listeners need when they need it. This is the balance and proportion of the speech. Remember, you should use the best supporting evidence. Although we recommend writing a full sentence outline during the speech preparation phase, you should also create a short outline you can use as notes, allowing for a strong delivery. If you were to use a full sentence outline when delivering your speech, you would do a great deal of reading, which would limit your ability to give eye contact and use gestures, hurting your connection with your audience. For this reason, we recommend writing a short phrase outline about five times six note cards to use when you deliver your speech. The good news is that your three main points suggest you should prepare your first note cards. Your first two times four note card can contain your thesis statement and other keywords and phrases that will help you present your introduction. Your second card can contain your first main point together with the key points and phrases to act as a map to follow your present. If your first main point has an abstract quotation you plan to present, you can include that in your card. Your third note card should be related to your second main point and your fourth card should be of the third main point and your fifth card should be related to your conclusion. In this way, 
The five note cards follow the same organizational patterns as the full outline. In the next section, we'll explore the more on how to create a speaking outline. When discussing outlining, we're actually focusing on a series of outlines instead of a single out one. Outlines are designed to evolve throughout your speech preparation process. So this section will discuss how it progress from a working outline to a full sentence outline and finally a speaking outline. We'll also discuss how note cards for your speaking outline can be helpful to you as a speaker. Hold on. Okay, so this is what one looks like. Oops, I went too far, sorry about that. Okay, so remember this, the story we heard earlier? So this is actually from about smart desk, the one we talked about last week and this week. So this is an example of a full sentence outline. You see right here, name, anomaly may, the name of the person speaking. Topic, smart desk, general purpose to inform. Specific purpose to inform a group of science students about the potential of a smart desk. Main ideas, smart desk assembly of microcomputer, smart desk could have enormous asset to convert military operations. Smart desk can have applications to daily life. Then we have the introduction. We have Grabber in 2002, famed science fiction, Michael Creighton released the book Prey, which is about a swarm of nanoparticles that are feeding off living tissue. The nanoparticles were solar powered, self-sufficient, intelligent. Most disturbingly, the nanoparticles could work together to swarm as a, and kill the prey in the new sources. The technology for the level of sophistication in nanotechnology surprisingly is more science fact than science fiction. In 2000, three professors of electrical engineering and computer science at the University of California, Berkeley, hypothesized the Journal of Communications and Networks. We can see right here, thesis statement preview. Today, I'm going to explain that smart dust is in the various applications. Smart dust has in the future transition to help understand smart dust. We will first examine smart dust. Main point one, mm -hmm. main point two, because smart dust is originally conceptualized in the grant from DARPA, military use of smart dust has been widely theorized. Okay. So now we have reviewed what an outline is. So you're familiar with what an outline is. You have mm -hmm. taken the last couple of weeks information and analyzed it and put it into your own. Last week we talked about jargon. I don't know if you're, you remember that, we talked about that. Yeah, so last week we talked about the introduction, how to begin the speech effectively. Mm -hmm. We also talked about creating the body of the speech. Today we talked about the body of the speech and the conclusion, and then also about the creation of the outline. And here we have it. This is the references that they used. This is APA format. If you're using MLA, it's a little bit different. Both of them need to be in alphabetical order, A, B, C order. When you prepare your full sentence outline carefully, it may be as much as one and a half hours to complete the first part. And when you complete it, take a break and do something. When you return to the outline, you should be able to complete your draft in another one and a half hours. It's always good to double check it. You can put it through systems like Grammarly.com. If you have to turn it in, you can do that. Another video time. This will be our last video and then we'll finish up the chapter.
This is how to magically connect with anyone. Well, thank you. <laughs> Our world is a shared experience, fractured by individual perspectives, yours and mine. Imagine if we could all understand each other. When I first started my career in magic, I was doing a lot of performing in restaurants, table to table, card tricks, coin tricks, sleight of hand, and it, woo. <laughs> Sorry, the last few was loud. <laughs> and this one night, I was on fire. I remember it, I was, fast and funny, my moves were perfect, I was unstoppable. And I sauntered up to this one, this one table, an elderly man and his wife, and I said, folks, would you like to see some magic? And the man looked at me and he said, sir, I would love to see some magic, but I can't. Unfortunately, I'm blind. And I looked at him, really looked at him for the first time, and it was so clear he was blind. He, his eyes were glazed, he wasn't really looking at me. Anybody would have known he was blind, but I, I was so wrapped up in my evening, so lost in my world, I, I wasn't looking at him. I just saw two generic people and I launched into my show. And I stood there, embarrassed, and that word was ringing in my ears, blind, 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 and I, I had no choice. I said, I'm sorry, I didn't know. I don't have anything I can do for you, but if you come back again sometime, I promise I'll have some sort of magic I can share with you. He said, I'll hold you to that, and I went on with my night. A few weeks later, they came back in. I recognized them immediately, and I panicked. I had completely forgotten about it. I raced back to the room where I kept my props, and I, I, I was thinking about every trick I'd ever learned, every book I'd ever read, something, anything I can do for this man, and then I, I remembered something obscure, an obscure idea, something I read a long time ago in an old manuscript. It's all I had, so I composed myself. I walked back out, and I said, hey, folks, my name is Brian. Would you like to see some magic? And he cut me off. He goes, all right, we're back. What do you got for me? With a big smile on his face. So I asked his wife, may I sit next to you? And she said, sure. So I, I sat down and I said, Ed, his name was Ed. I said, Ed, do you trust your wife? He said, sometimes. <laughs> I said, will you trust her now? He said, sure. So I took out a pack of playing cards, gave them to her and said, mix the cards, make sure there's no special markings on them. She said, no, they're fine. And I took Ed's hand and I said, I'm gonna place a card in your hand. Do you think this is a red card or a black card? And he said, Red, and he was right. Put the next card, and he said, red. He was right again. And I put the next one, and he said, mm, black. Again, correct, his wife is getting skeptical at this point, and we keep going, red, red, black, black, red. He's getting all of them right, red, black, red, faster, black, 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 red through the whole deck, black, black, red, every single one of them right at the end of it, and is laughing, he's howling, the whole restaurant is staring at us, and I turn, and his wife, his wife, weeping, tears of joy. It was the most beautiful magic I had ever experienced. And a little bit later, I'm going to tell you how we did it. But the real secret of the trick, the real secret of magic, is understanding and taking on different perspectives, different points of view. So let's try an experiment with perspective. Would you guys like to see some magic? All right, let's try a little experiment here. This is, this is one of the oldest illusions in magic. Here we go, check that out for me. That's, that's yes please, here we go. That's, uh, that's rope right there, you can check that out. And uh, I've got some more over here. Here we go, one for you, yes. Here we go, and one for you. Make sure that's what it seems to be. Is it what it seems to be? Are you what you seem to be? I don't know what that means, that's good. I'll take that back, that's, uh, you look as confused as I do. Here we go, take that, yes, thank you. One, two, three pieces of rope. Three pieces of rope and they're all the same length, yes? gonna be a tough crowd, I can tell. Now I'm gonna take, you guys are gonna have to believe me on this. I'll take the ends and I hold them up. Now they look like they're the same length. The ends do. Not, I didn't say it was a great illusion. It's gonna be a tough crowd, I think. Here we go, I'll prove it to you. Here, watch. <laughs> yeah, that's the, uh, that's, oh, thank you. That's, a, <laughs> that's the big one right there. That's the uh, medium one right there. And that's the small one right there. And there's too many things going on, so I'll get rid of one of the pieces of rope. It'll be easier to follow with only two, won't it? Maybe I should just start over for, uh, for you guys. Would that be a little bit simple? Yeah, sometimes the ends come off, which is a little unusual. I'll give you that, but I'll do that again just in case you missed it. There are, there are people who think that this trick is all about the ends. That's not true. The middles, those come off too. <laughs> Place the middles right here back on the rope. 
we're back in business, but you guys know this trick wasn't done with one piece of rope. It wasn't even done with two pieces. It was actually done with two of us watched Sesame Street. That was good. <laughs> that's, that's the big one right there. That's the uh, medium one right there, and that's the small one right there. Can you guys tell which one's which from the beginning? Can you tell? See this one right here? This is the big one. You see, that's the big one. That's the medium one, and that's the small one. A little illusion to get things started. Well, thank you very much. Now, so what just happened there? Well, it seems that you and I had a very different experience, doesn't it? What did I see? I saw the moves, the sleight of hand, the juggling. You probably saw the ends of a rope jumping on and off, three different ropes changing length impossibly, violating all the laws of physics. <laughs> but that's just what we saw. What did we feel? Well, you may have felt uh, hopefully wonder, maybe amusement, perhaps frustration. I felt focus. These are two very different perspectives of the same experience. You see, magicians have a unique dilemma. The magician is the only person who cannot see the magic because I know how the trick works. And that knowledge of the secret is a limiting perspective. So the magician must wholly and completely take on the point of view of the audience. We do this night after night, no matter who's out there, in order to create illusions. This is a technique called perspective taking. Perspective taking is the ability to see the world from the point of view of another person. It sounds simple in theory, but in practice it can be incredibly difficult to do. For instance, have you guys played around with one of these before? Aha, uh -huh. a few of you look excited, most of you look angry just because I'm holding one. I, can feel, I feel flashbacks to childhood, some of you started twitching when I took one out. I love the Rubik's Cube, they're actually easier to solve than you think they are. Uh, take the stickers off, rearrange them, put them back in the right order. Yes, break the pieces apart, put it back together. I actually learned how to do this, and then I realized if you spin it really fast, it looks like it solves itself. <laughs> now, <laughs> so what just happened there? Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a delayed response, everybody just... <laughs> so what just happened there? Well, I know that if I come out, mix up a Rubik's Cube, toss it in the air, and it comes down solved, you're all going to think I'm a jerk. <laughs> or at the very least, to show off. And I don't want you to feel like that. I want you to enjoy the experience of magic. So I make a few jokes. Take the stickers off, rearrange it, break the pieces apart. When I do that, you go, oh, I did that, my friends. We smashed it with a hammer. We threw it at a wall. We... When, you, when that happens, you feel like I understand you. And when you feel understood, we make a connection. And then I can do the trick. And we can all enjoy the magic in that shared space. So now you know what perspective taking is. It's the ability to see the world from the point of view of another person. And you know why magicians do it, to create illusions and connect with the audience. But why should you care? Well, it turns out this technique has drastically improved my life off stage, outside of magic, in more ways than I could have ever imagined. I'll explain. I never had trouble meeting new people, making friends, getting into relationships, but I always struggled to maintain them. Eventually, the communication would break down, people would leave, and I would be alone. And it took a long time to admit it, but it was my fault, or at least mostly my fault. The people in my life didn't feel like I was invested in them. Now, that wasn't true, but it doesn't matter. It's not enough to care about somebody. It's not enough to understand them. They have to feel understood. They have to feel cared about. And I wasn't doing that. And then I took this technique I had honed on stage and I started using it outside of magic and I realized I could make better, more meaningful connections with people. I met friends, incredible friends that have lasted years. I, I met a beautiful, fiercely intelligent woman, the love of my life, and I held on to that relationship. We're actually engaged to be married. Oh, thank you. <laughs> She'll be happy to hear that. <laughs> None of that would have been possible before. So of course the question then becomes how? How do you do it? How do you do perspective taking? Well, first you need to understand the difference between uh, visual perspective and emotional perspective. 
Magicians traditionally deal with visual perspective. We need to know literally what the trick looks like to the audience. So we practice in front of mirrors, we film ourselves and watch it back, but relationships are primarily about emotional perspective. How is somebody feeling about our interaction? It seems like a difficult thing to do, to get to know someone's emotional perspective, but let's get back to Ed, Ed and his wife. The relevant question for Ed was, what would magic feel like to someone who is blind? I didn't want Ed to feel tricked. That was important to me. I don't know, but I have to imagine if you're blind, you could be tricked by anybody at any time. So I didn't want Ed to feel tricked. I wanted him to feel magic. I wanted him to be magical. <coughs> wife, this woman who spends her life looking out for him, I wanted her to see him in that light and for them to share in that experience together. So if you want to get to know someone's emotional perspective, one of the simplest ways to do it, ask. Ask questions. Too often we're afraid to ask people questions because we feel like it will be rude or somehow they won't want to answer, but we underestimate people's willingness to answer our questions. Before the trick, I asked Ed, have you always been blind? He said yes. To me, that was crucial, relevant information. It seems that a person who has never been able to see will have a different perspective from somebody who had their sight and then lost it to accident or to illness. With Ed, I can't even use the language of sight. So by asking questions, I can adjust my tone, my demeanor, even my language, so that he feels understood and we can make a connection. Now, if you're going to learn this, it's important not simply to ask questions, but to listen to the answers and listen to understand. Don't just listen to respond or to reply. You've heard it before. This is where I went wrong most in my life, I think. You've heard it before, and we're all guilty of it from time to time, but too often we listen to people only with the intention of coming up with something clever to say. So as soon as their lips stop moving, we can jump in and say our thing. We've all done it, we're all guilty of it, but I did this especially badly, and I think to the detriment of my relationships. Have you ever asked for somebody's name and instantly forgotten what it was? You know why we forget people's names? Because while they're telling us their name, we're thinking about how we're gonna say ours. First name, last name, Mr. Miller, Brian, put out your hand. We're not listening. We're on our end of the conversation only. So you can start to learn this technique. Ask questions, listen to understand the answers. When you do that, I think you'll find you can make better, more meaningful connections with people, personally and professionally. It drastically improved my life, and I really believe it can improve yours. So. Ed, how did Ed, a blind man, see the cards? The answer, as in most great magic, was actually very simple. I sat across from him, and underneath the table, I placed my foot gently on top of his. And then I gave him these instructions. I said, if you think the card is a red card, and I pushed my foot down on his once, then you say red. If you think it's a black card, and I pushed my foot down on his twice, then you say black. I was teaching Ed a secret system of communication where I would let him know what color the card was by the foot taps, once for red, twice for black. And I repeated the instructions. If you think it's a red card, say red. If you think it's a black card, say black. And then I squeezed his hand gently and I asked, do you understand? And he smiled and he said, yes, I understand. And I knew then that we had connected. When it was all said and done, I taught his wife how we did it like I just taught you so they could go do it for their friends and family and Ed was so excited he couldn't wait to see his grandkids that weekend so he could quote freak them out completely. <laughs> <laughs> see magic isn't about the technical skill, magic isn't about a trick or even the secret, magic is about connecting. Life is about connecting and connecting is about taking on other points of view. You see our world is a shared experience fractured by individual perspectives. Imagine if we could all feel understood. Thank you. All right, back to the chapter. So he did it really great. He presented himself well, and he had a good amount of main speaking points. And he also connected to you in a sense that he wanted to remind you what we need to be doing with our audience connecting to them and not leaving anybody out. And yes, somebody is blind, but he can still partake in it. Just you have to change it and be creative to include him. 
So don't think the references are busy work or druggery. They're more than time consuming the text. Always have your references because your audience members might ask you, hey, where did you get that from? Or can you share that link with me? And you, now you're able to share. You, you will have your full sentence outline. It's clear and it's well organized, but you shouldn't just be reading it verbatim. If you forget, you can always glance at it, but you shouldn't be reading it verbatim because you've already practiced it. Your speech has five main components. Remember that introduction, main point one, main point two, main point three, and a conclusion. If this was a paper, it'd probably be a five paragraph paper. Uh, therefore, we strongly recommend the use of five note cards, one for each of the five components. You could do that as well. Usually three by five or four, four times six. If you're hard to see, you might have to get a little bit bigger, maybe like a five times seven, but then your audience might be able to see what you wrote too. So you can put the trick in selecting phrases, quotations from your cards to identify the labels that trigger recall sequence. Like right here, we have the word pray. It's a phrase in your card that supports you through fairly extended part of your introduction. You must discover what works for you and then select those words that tend to jog your recall. Having identified what works makes a preliminary set of no more than five cards written on one side only and the practice with them. Revise and refine them as you would outline. And the following is a hypothetical set of cards in the smart desk speech. Okay, so right here we have the cards. You would put this on the first card, second card and third card. You may have to type it up unless you can write really small, but you can always type it up and then cut it and like paste it on the cards too. And then card five. And card six could have your conclusion. All right, so that gives us some good ideas. You can use your outline for success, singularity. Some of us are gonna have it longer than others, but you wanna have singularity, stick to one point possible and then do sub points. We have consistency, so keep it consistent. I had a student one time do a speech on therapy dogs and the next thing you know, he's writing about Las Vegas and then he presented that and then the whole focus was Las Vegas and the students were asking, oh, uh, can you tell me about Las Vegas? And they didn't even remember it was therapy dogs for his topic. So that's an example of what not to do. Adequacy, make sure your audience will understand your speech, set aside assumption. Uniformity, full sentence outline, parallelism. It refers to the idea, three main points, follow the same structure. Okay. Next week, we'll be talking about the importance of language. All right, so that concludes today. Thank you so much, everybody. And I'll see you next week. And don't forget to do your homework questions and your summary for the week. Bye now. Thank you.